Ariana Grande is officially back with her seventh record, Eternal Sunshine, loosely based on the classic sci-fi film Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Honestly, I was going to rush a review overnight, but I really had to sit down and listen to this record, even revisit the classic movie to really give an honest review and reaction. Unlike my previous recaps, I'm going to give general thoughts before doing a track-by-track -track deep dive. First things first, I've only had a full day with this record, and I kid you not, this might be my favorite Ariana record to date if we're just looking at the music alone. While Yes San made this seem like this is going to be a dance record, it's actually a sublime masterclass on channeling 2000s R&B mixed with Max Martin's impeccable pop polish. And can we talk about the masterful vocal production Grande does here? I kept changing my top three tracks every listen, which really speaks to how each track takes its own time to really be understood. Over the last month, I actually had recapped two of Ariana's big eras, wondering why this rollout for this era has felt all over the place, and I'm realizing Grande and her team have been playing this by ear. The music video for We Can't Be Friends is lead single material. I felt like it showed up the album's concepts and tone way better than launching with Yes And, which definitely played off recent drama and served as a sponge, no pun intended, to absorb the blow back of the whole home wrecking saga. Eternal Sunshine serves as a diary response, a very strong divorce record, and a confessional that again shows Grande's growth and evolution as an artist. For my Lana stands out there, this is very much the ocean boulevard to positions blue banisters. Lyrically, production-wise, and conceptually, this is Grande's most polished effort to date. It feels like a happy medium between Sweetener and Thank You Next, which both represented different poles of Grande's sensibilities. Eternal Sunshine initially felt like a direct sequel to Thank You Next, thematically speaking to the turbulence afterwards, it speaks to great upheaval caused by Saturn return, an astrological phenomenon that occurs every 29 and a half years of someone's life. Grande talks about exiting this period and entering a more stable life, and this aspect hit me really hard with my own life because apparently I'm in my own Saturn return. The sequencing of the record really follows a more linear story. It opens up with the question, how can I tell if I'm in the right relationship? Only the close with wise words from her Nona about how if you can't kiss them at night after a fight, get out of there. She goes on to really discuss the process of uncoupling before the Saturn Returns interlude breaks towards the aftermath and relearning how to love and enjoy life again, but also reconciling with the new reality and seeing things are better now. I really thought that the concept was brilliant. I sat down and I rewatched the film recently, and it's so amazing seeing the We Can't Be Friends music video, how closely it mirrors the film's story, showing the Erisher process of memory, but unlike Jim Carrey's character in that story, She's not fighting it. At the very end, her love interest Evan Peters and her pass by each other, both clearly lobotomized and forgotten to each other. There's a sense of finality to it, which speaks to this record feeling like both a closed book and a new chapter. Eternal Sunshine celebrates Grande's versatility as an artist, yet somehow being one of her most cohesive works to date, where all the tracks, even Yes And, which I thought was the weakest link, all of these tracks interlink and interlock to each other to tell a good story. This one's for the fans. Grande publicly called out leakers of her music, but graciously reimagines fantasize into true story. Knowing we all want a bad girl anthem, she reimagines Brandy and Monica's The Boy's Mine into a camp villain banger. Fans looking for songs to cry to have the last few tracks to heal to. I think that the record's only weakness is the reliance on the concept. Most of these songs are strong enough to stand alone, but everything is much stronger when listened to as a unit, which speaks to how curated this record is. But again, listening to some of them alone just doesn't work for me. I think that's why Yes And didn't work initially, it needed the other tracks. Honestly, if you ask me, this is actually Ariana's most intellectual record to date, in my honest opinion. It's an active listen, you need to listen to the lyrics, you need to soak in the instrumentals. This is just a vibes record and that might be a bit intimidating for some listeners and before i go into each track can we talk about how crystal clear her vocals sound the training that she had for wicked really came through this is the first record i didn't have to look up lyrics to make sure i didn't mishear a lyric Grande's vocals continue to improve throughout her career, where Grande had coasted on the raw power of her vocals. On this record, she sounds like refined gold. And now we're gonna go through the album track by track. In classic Ariana Grande fashion, there's a beautiful intro, End of the World, which again posits the deeper question
versions of the record over a lo-fi guitar, stringy sounding beat. Her musical theater roots take hold here where she's resolved to find out if she's in the right place. The last part where she asks, if it all ended tomorrow, would you be the one on my mind? I think that this is like metaphorically the beginning of the erasing process. Bye follows as a very sassy, brash song where she's just done being hostage to the tears. It's a really fun allusion to the no tears left to cry. Like she really doesn't have any tears left. There's a fun disco beat, which she revealed was a homage to her mother who had also had a divorce and she had felt like she was repeating a cycle, but instead wanted to emulate her mother. It's a really cool kind of note that she mentioned on her Amazon music. If you have that, go check it out. There's an empowering feeling to the track. Bye doesn't really feel like a screw you. It feels more like a respectful, I have to leave which is a really cool departure from the usual boy bye kind of sound. Her bestie Courtney is in the driveway and she's making her get away. The hook is so simplistic, but an earworm. And I, again, the, the vocal layering, the usage of her voice is just next level on this record. The bridge is very simple, but self-aware, even talking about how hard the hook is to sing. I like the fact that it gives this sort of like a live feel, like she's in the studio aware that she's recording a song. And that final chorus and those ad libs are heavenly. This was a smashing way to start the record. Don't Wanna Break Up is a calmer aftermath of Bye that contains much needed context. The opening lines actually condemn her ex for being inattentive to her and not hearing her out with her crying. I'm Too Much For You does become a theme in this record that's called back to an imperfect for you. The chorus speaks to this conversation that she's having about her situationship, which is a really wild way to refer to a former marriage. She doesn't wanna break up again because she just wants to end it for good. I really like the melodic switch on the bridge where she does end it amicably for good. Hope he doesn't regret her and thinks fondly of the life because she's gone, it's done. Then we get the Saturn Return interlude, and the placement makes a lot of sense. I think it serves as a marker in between the first three tracks and the other nine. It also marks the beginning of her waking up and getting real with her own life because Saturn has returned into her life, forcing her to confront and change herself. I think it's ironic that Saturn Return ends into Eternal Sunshine. The title track Eternal Sunshine feels far more connected to the present day. Verse one sees her admit that her ex was just not good for her. He's a liar and she's stuck in a loop. The pre-chorus flips the existing narrative that we know where it turns out there was another woman in her bed and now she doesn't know what to do. The chorus is a callback to Needy's line about saying sorry too much. She's shown her demons and her lies, which I thought was a callback to the all of my pretty and all of my ugly too on POV, but he still played her like an Atari. The lines, hope you feel all right when you're in her, those lines gagged me, I'm sorry. But they do get the point across that she was the one that was being cheated on at some point. Her ex is the eternal sunshine, a past relationship she wishes she could kind of wipe out from her brain, but she learns from. Verse two is about wanting to erase, but she's just gonna choose to move on. And the bridge feels like an anxiety attack. Like she's trying to put words together and I think it evokes the feeling of forgetting, but holding on to ideas like life, death, and rewind. I think it's a neat allusion to how things disappear from the mind in that movie. If you see the movie, this album makes way more sense. Go see the movie. You don't need to see the movie to get the album, but trust me, it makes the album infinitely better. Supernatural follows, and it's more of a vibey R&B track that speaks to the more astrological and mystical themes of the record. I don't think it's a heavy track, it's rather atmospheric. It really captures the feeling of falling in love. I think there's a casual sensuality to it that Ariana really pulls off, where she compares her desire to destiny and fate. She wants someone to claim her like a manifestation. The way that she floats over the beat but remains clear in her enunciation, it really feels like an evolution of her dangerous woman sound with a couple of splashes of positions in there. I found the last chorus to be particularly spellbinding with its ad libs. True Story recontextualizes the leaked fan favorite song, Fantasize. Initially created for a girl group skit, this track actually addresses the media's game of painting her out to be a villain. She's going to play the villain because apologizing doesn't do anything. The production on this track is actual perfection. It's a very R&B track that throws back to that late 90s sound. Grande had been so sad about the leak, so seeing her reclaim it and make it into something new, that's actually pretty inspiring. Max Martin's production on this record is tight, but this is actually one of his stronger efforts on the record, and Grande's ear for a hook is, again, top tier. As a fan of the original Fantasize, I was worried I was going to hate True Story, but I do think it's a worthy rework, and if you really do prefer Fantasize, you can just listen to the leaked version. 
But this really does sound wonderful, fully mastered. The Boy is Mine is a direct sequel to True Story and the Bad Girl Anthem off the record. Many questioned if she was going to rework Brandy and Monica's classic and how it play out, and I think she actually killed it. I think narratively she succumbed to this character that she made up in True Story. She's become the home wrecker the media has painted her out to be. The first verse almost feels satirical with how camp she comes across. The pre-chorus feels more like a siren's call for her lover to choose her than an actual real pre-chorus. And the chorus is just perfection. Uh, there's a reason why they reuse that hook. I love her inflection though, the blasphemy of it all. It's really giving camp villain in a movie. The bridge feels like a wink where she says, I take full accountability for all these tears, but I can't ignore my heart. It, it almost feels like a break from that narrative to say that she's not sorry. I know that the TikTok investigators are going to really have a field day with this one. They're going to be mad. I've already discussed Yes And to Death, but it now makes a lot of sense serving as a closer to that banger section of the record. This is her discarding the whole narrative and the story and the character that she's made up to kind of reclaim herself in Madonna Vogue-like fashion. The crown jewel of the record and the new single is We Can't Be Friends, Wait For Your Love, which I initially viewed as a traditional love song, but have come to interpret as a letter to the media and the general public at large. This is a song about not wanting to feed a monster respire and needing the story to die. We Can't Be Friends is addressed to those who believe the lies, but she likes to pretend that they'll stop clinging to their papers and pens and like her again one day. The patience in this track isn't just directed towards the lover she's singing about, it's directed towards people waiting for them to realize the truth is gonna come out and she still has love in her heart for them. Verse 2 is a conversation to her younger self, Baby Girl is about her inner child. She's misunderstood, but at least she knows she looks good. The bridge speaks to this awareness that the public has made her who she is today, but she feels more seen in the night and maybe all she needs right now is herself. I found that line to speak to how she's starting to reject being a public figure and how she feels like her most authentic self in private nowadays. Yet still, she waits optimistically and hopes that love will come back to her, whether it's a literal lover or the people realizing that there's nuance to the situation. The Europop production is amazing, Varden and Ilya really did kill it on this record. I Wish I Hated You is Ari's soft and proper tender lamentation that she wishes that she could just hate her ex. She touches into the nuance of her past, she wishes that it was clear cut, she wants this nuance for herself, uh, but she also gives it to her former lover. The floating quality of the instrumental done by Ilya really gives this a dreamlike glaze that works well. The ad-libs add so much, as well as the vocal layering, which again is the highlight of this record and positions her previous album. The lines about shadows in a parallel plane really speak to how incompatible she and her ex were. They exist on different planes of reality. This is definitely one of the sweeter, gentler tracks, and I feel like it'd be overlooked compared to the more bombastic tracks. Imperfect For You has a very unique, messy guitar sound to it. Apparently, it was Grande's favorite track in the last one that was made for the record. I felt like the pop sheen is ditched for a clunkier, conversational style, very akin to musical theater. A background that Grande has never been shy about. She relays dense lyrics that again fit the theme of imperfection, the hook being a pun imperfect for you. I'm perfect for you because I'm fucked up, anxious, too much. She loves this band the way that she needs them to. The pre-chorus is actually really hookier for me than the chorus. I really love that line, I'm glad we crashed and burned because it reminded me of Honeymoon Avenue's imagery of an impending crash. But unlike that song on her first record, she has no regrets. She's not worried about crashing. The album closes with Ordinary Things with her Nona, which feels like a perfect cap to the story, but sonically and thematically, there's a slick, steady, ticking production that feels like the calm of a storm or a clock. She speaks to the hypothetical great things that she and her lover could do, but she just really wants more time as it ticks a by away from her. The chorus is so sweet, there are no ordinary things they do as long as she's with them, but it's really Marjorie Grande's closing statements and answer to the opening question that Grande has at the start that really do close this album out well.
it turns out that if you can't kiss them goodnight every night through good and bad, you're in the wrong place and you need to get out. I That's the answer to how do I know if I'm in the right relationship that she asked at the start. And I do think that to a degree, that is a very elegant answer. That's going to stick with me, as will this record. I'm glad to award it a 9.1 out of 10. I think that it's just a very solid, well-realized body of work that tells a very strong story about healing, hope, and memory, much like the original original brilliant movie that it's based off. I do need to see more of the visuals. I want to see how this era plays out, if it's going to be more conventional. I'm not sure if she's going to tour it, but this album so far has really clicked with me and resonated with me, and I'm glad that it turned out this way and not like 13 versions of Yes And. And that's a wrap. Thank you so much for tuning in to my review of Eternal Sunshine. Again, I know I'm late. I know that like I probably should have had this published on Friday morning, but I needed time to really digest this. I think this is one of the more denser works that she's ever done. And I find it really fascinating looking at the themes and doing analysis. So thank you for your patience. I want to shout out my members. Thank you so much for supporting my channel. I want to shout out my subscribers. Thank you, all of you. Subscribing is the best way you can help my channel comment your favorite track on this record, uh, comment how you feel about the visuals and the themes. I love interacting with you guys and I can't wait to see you next video.